Before I go into the message, I would just like to encourage everybody to continue to pray for Ukraine, for the people. Um, I think it's been like a month today, so I think it's very easy to kind of forget to do that. I think it's, you know, nothing, not not to condemn anybody. But I think every time we think of Ukraine, I think let's just continue to, to pray for them. Let's just take 10 seconds, 15 seconds when we think of them, and we continue to pray. Before I give you the title for this message, I, I want to read you a couple of scriptures um, that I think we will build on those verses to, to, to bring the message. We will build the message on those verses. And I know it's like we are in open air. It feels like we are on a crusade somewhere in the field. There's a lot of noise distractions. I know where I'm going with the message. It's not going to be two hours long. So just bear with me. We're going somewhere. I promise you we're going somewhere. Luke 24, verse 39. This is Jesus. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Jesus spoke those words a few moments before his ascension, before he went to be with the Father. So he, he, he promised this to his disciples. He will send the Holy Spirit. Now, Acts 1, this is just before receiving that promise. The disciples left the Mount of Olives and returned to Jerusalem, less than a mile away. Arriving there, they went into a large second floor room to pray. Some versions say the upper room. All of them, 120, were united in prayer, gripped with one passion, interceding night and day. It feels like the wind has calmed down a bit. All of them were united in prayer, Grip with one passion, interceding night and day. Let me read you Isaiah as well, chapter 6. Isaiah, from all the Old Testament books, is the book that has the most messianic references. Uh, in other words, um, references meaning um, from all the books of the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah has the most references to Jesus' ministry on earth, what he did, who he was, what he was going to do, and who who he is. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 to 3. In the year that King Hosea died, or 740 BC, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. We have to pause. <laughs> have you ever seen Jesus? Have you ever experienced him? Have you ever felt his touch? Have you ever felt his forgiveness? If you have, you are a changed person. If you have not, I pray this morning, you'll hear him calling you by name. I pray this morning you'll see him. It will change your life. It will change your life. In the year that King Hosea died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Verse 2, above him were seraphim or, or angels, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. Last verse, verse 3. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. I'd like to title this message, The Waiting Room. The Waiting Room. Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do in our hearts. Amen. Amen. So, Jesus comes to earth, lives for 33 and a half years on earth, goes to the cross for you and me to pay the debt of our sin. He's resurrected. Now, between his resurrection... And his ascension to the throne of God, he spends 40 days on earth appearing to his disciples. Between the ascension of Jesus and the and Pentecost, him, the Holy Spirit coming, there is a period of 10 days. 10 days. 10 days between the promise of the Holy Spirit to come and the actual fulfillment of that promise. 10 days in the waiting room. Now, the disciples didn't know how long that period of time would be. They didn't know how much the waiting would be. But their attitude tells us they were surrendered to his timing, 
and to his ways. They knew something exceptional, unprecedented was coming, something that would change everything was on the way. They were at the right place at the right time, but they had to wait. What do we do when we are in that waiting room? Have you ever felt like, to the best of your ability, you've done everything you feel the Lord has asked you to do? As far as you can tell, you've done everything you know how to do, but you have to wait. You know there's something more coming. That room represents a season or a period of time between what God spoke, promised, and the actual fulfillment of that promise. You can recognize if you're in that room by your hunger or longing for something more. You are grateful, you are thankful, but at the same time, you know there is more. There is a tension. I am grateful, I am content, but I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. Let me read you again as I experience, just verse 2. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Those angels must have been beautiful, beautiful creatures to look at. They were, they were holy, they were, they were in the presence of God, in the glory. It would have taken a breath away just to look at them. Yet what they did with their wings is what I want to talk about today. I was watching an interview with the evangelist Rana Bonkin and he, in that interview he gave an interpretation of that passage in Isaiah chapter 6. And when I heard him talking about that passage, it touched my heart. I want to tell you what that was this morning. So with each set of wings they did something very specific. Covered their faces, covered their feet, and they flew. They flew. Number one, with the first set of wings that cover the faces, number one, it's not about me. It's about him. Psalms 39, verse 4 and 5. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. And so it's not about me, but he wants to use me. There's a tension. They decided to cover their faces so that no one would lay eyes on them instead of the king. They had an attitude of, of humility. Now, I used to find it difficult when people would compliment me. I, I didn't know how to, 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 to take it, how to handle it, because if I would say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's not really me, it's all God, that's a bit false humility, because clearly my humanity had a, had a role in what I did. It, wasn't, it, was, it was good, but it wasn't that good. If it was all God, you would know it was all God. But again, to take the credit for it, that would be arrogant. So I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to, 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 do, to, to handle that. And so I like the way Brooke Lingerwood from Hillsong says it. She says, every compliment I receive is a flower. And so throughout my day, I, I go through my day and, and I may receive a flower or ten flowers. But at the end of the day, I make sure I offer a bouquet to God. And so because I was a very, very insecure person in my teenage years and early 20s, I remember many instances bragging about my accomplishments, what I did, where I was, who I knew, to compensate my insecurities. I realize that now, that maybe every time I did that, people saw, saw more of me than Christ through me. And so even to this day, sometimes I, 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 I pick myself up, I, I remember, Jeremy, why, why did you just say that? Why did you just... Say that. You, know, you don't have to say that. And so I'm learning to take my security, not from what I do or say or know, but from who Jesus is in my life. It's very simple to do. If you've never done that, you, you, something like that. Hey, Jesus, I'm a bit insecure. Help me to feel secure in what you did on the cross for me. Start there. It's amazing. It is amazing. And so to live a Christian life with an attitude that says, it's not about me, 
in a world that screams it's all about you can be a challenge. I've read online 93 million selfies are posted per day. <laughs> 10 selfies are posted on Instagram every 10 seconds. So I've done the math. That's 33 billion, 945 million selfies per year. Could it be that we think it's about us? <laughs> I think we think that. And so it's about him, but he wants to work through me. There's a tension. I like the way Bishop T.D. Jerk says it. He said, if he can get it through you, he'll give it to you. We can go home just with that. And so I pray that we will never forget to cover our faces so that people will see Christ in us and not just us. I was watching an interview with Bishop T.D. Jakes and the lady was asking him, how do you deal with all the uh, accolades, all the celebration that people give you? When you walk in a room, people stand, they clap. How do you deal with all the, the books, the television? And he he gave that illustration, he said, when Jesus rolled on a donkey to enter Jerusalem, all the uh, celebration, the shouts, the palm branches, all the noise, all the excitement, it wasn't really for the donkey, it was for Jesus. And as long as we remember that we are donkeys, we won't get confused. <laughs> we won't get confused. So with the first set of wings, they covered their faces. With the second, number two, they covered their feet. Living a life of purity. Living a life of purity. Psalms 119 verse 9. How can a young man or a woman, young man, a uh, person, stay pure? How can a young person stay pure? Only by living in the word of God and walking in its truth. Only. I can live a life of purity as I let the Word of God in my heart and make decisions based on His Word. So when I say purity, uh, I mean every area of our lives, our relationships, our sexuality, our finances, our thinking, what, how we handle ourselves, everything. It's like the orange dust we had the last couple of weeks. It goes absolutely everywhere. And so living a life of purity is letting Jesus into every area of our lives. Yesterday we went to wash our car because of the red dust and it goes everywhere. I don't know if you've washed your car yet, I mean it's, it goes everywhere, every corner of the car, everywhere. We spent like an hour waiting to get in the queue to wash our car. It was us and probably half of the coast trying to wash their cars. We were committed to wash our car. Are you ready for this? If we were as committed to wash our car as to pray, Okay, leave that alone. Leave that alone. Don't get me started. So why does it matter to live a life of purity? It matters because people recognize fake very quickly, especially teenagers, but people in general. I've shared this story uh, in the past few weeks, but I think it's worth repeating. Uh, Lisa, Simon, and I, we ran a youth group for five years, and it took us some time to understand why 12 teenagers will choose to spend their Friday evenings with us. We didn't have, I didn't have Snapchat, Instagram, we didn't listen to the same music than them, but they came every Friday for five years. I think two reasons why they came. Number one, our love for them. Number two, the presence of God. They recognize there is something different in those Friday nights. There is something different. There was something after, something authentic, something real. And I'm finding out that people who live a life of purity, not perfection, but where we do our best to represent Jesus, it's contagious, it carries weight. The, the presence of God has a resting place. The favor of God has a resting place. And so a real test to know if I live a life of purity is this. Do people notice there is something different about me? Is it noticeable in the way that I walk? in the way that I talk, in how I handle criticism, how I handle praise? Can people see a difference? Or am I so blending in with the crowd around me that when I say I'm a Christian, people are shocked, shocked. 
I used to blend in with the crowd so much in my teenage years that when I told my friends that I grew up as a missionary teen, uh, went to church, had Christian values, they did not believe me. They were, they were shocked that, are you a Christian? Now that's not a compliment, okay? That's not good. When we are in the waiting room, in other words, not knowing when God is going to do something, or what He's going to do, or how He's going to do it, it's very easy to lower our standards to ease the waiting. I've done that. I like what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Now, what Paul wrote to Timothy is a road map for us to live in purity. When Paul wrote this letter, he was in prison in Rome. Moments, maybe days or weeks before he was executed. And so he would have chosen his words very carefully. He could have said anything else, but he chose to say this. Run as fast as you can from all the ambitions and lusts of youth. And chase after all that is pure. What is pure? Whatever builds up your faith and deepens your love must become your holy pursuit. And live in peace with all those who worship our Lord Jesus with pure hearts. And so, how can we know if what we are involved is in is pure? Paul said, whatever builds up your faith and deepens your love. In other words, is what I say, is what I do, is how I carry myself representing Jesus well. Is it deepening my love for God and for people? And so, with the first set of weeds, they cover their faces. It's not about me, it's about Him. With the second pair of weeds, they cover their feet, walking in purity. And with the third, they flew. Number three, they worshipped the Lord. They worshipped the Lord. Psalms 95, verse 6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 1. O Lord, You are my God. I will exalt You. I will praise You and give thanks to Your name. For you have done miraculous things, plans for long, long ago, fulfilled with perfect faithfulness. He is extremely good. God is extremely good, faithful. When we are in the waiting room, we must continue to worship Him. When you are not sure what God is doing, how is going to do it? Through whom is going to do it? When is going to do it? And you somehow have the nerve and the audacity and the courage to worship Him. That's faith. That's real faith. That, that's the kind of faith that's not dependable upon you knowing everything. But it's the faith that depends upon Him being good and trustworthy. There are many ways we can worship the Lord. Paul said in Romans 12, he said, Oh, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. Listen to this. This is truly the way to worship him. We can worship the Lord with everything he has entrusted us, our, our bodies, our times, our talents, our our energy, our relationships, our influences, everything can become an act of worship for Him. Worship becomes something much more than an outward manifestation. It's an attitude of the heart. It's an attitude that says and that prays, Your kingdom come, Your will be done. I found that when we are in the waiting room, it's very tempting to produce the promise or the call in the flesh. In other words, what God has promised when we are waiting and we are not seeing when He's going to do it, it's very easy to start doing it in our own power, in our own strength, in our own resources, in our own timings, in our own wisdom. Very easy to do. It's an attitude that says, well God, if that's how you're going to do it, well, I'm going to do it my way for it to go quicker. Abraham and Sarah were in the waiting room for 25 years. 25 years. At 75 years old, God spoke to Abraham and promised him a son. 10 years into the waiting room, at age 85, Abraham and Sarah got tired of waiting 
and they produce the promise in the flesh. This is when Ishmael was born. Abraham was 86 when he was born. And so when we run ahead of God, ahead of his timing, you can read the story. It's complicated. It gets complicated. What you create in your own efforts, you're going to have to sustain in your own efforts. At 100 years old, Isaac is finally born. 25 years between what God spoke, waiting room, fulfillment of the promise, 25 years. I found that God prepares you in the waiting room, prepares other people for you in the waiting room. And every time I say this, I never have claps or, or shouts of celebration. But in the waiting room, he is building your character and your integrity to sustain the weight of your calling. Moses spends 40 years being prepared. Paul, 13 years. Jesus, 30 years. Could it be that you and I, we're going to have a season of waiting room? I think it will be possible. And so the disciples illustrate a great example to follow. They were waiting. They didn't run ahead of God. They were in prayer, in surrender, in worship. I can have the team back, please. They were waiting in prayer, in surrender, and in worship. And so when the promises of God come to pass in my life, I would like my heart to do, to do three things. Number one, knowing it's not about me. It's about Him. Number two, living in purity. Living in the Word of God. And number three, worshipping the Lord. To have an attitude of surrender to Him daily. We can stand to our feet. And I'd love for you to pray and you can say I'd love for you to to pray and you can do this online as well. You can say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? What are you saying to me, Lord? I open my heart. Speak to me. Speak to me, Holy Spirit. I don't want to assume what I know. I don't want to assume you say something. I want like I would like to hear from you this morning. Guide me in my thoughts, guide me in my actions. Help me to represent you well this week. Help me to be an ambassador for you, Jesus. Cause the people to stop and ask me, what is it different about you? presence. I ask that you fill up your heart, Lord. Lord, where there is burdens, where there is difficulties, Lord, I ask that you come and fill those places with your peace, with the supernatural presence, Lord. Come and do what only you can do this morning. Lord, I pray that no one leaves without knowing that you are real, knowing that you exist, knowing that you are on the throne, knowing that you hold us in the palm of your hand. If you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus, Like Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. If you've never seen Him, 
without any filters on the, the filter of religion or the filter of, of culture or the filter of history or the filter of, of um, uh, assumptions of who he is I'm talking about a face to face encounter no filters, no masks but for who he is and you say Jeremy I don't want to leave this place without experiencing that now this moment is for you now and I'd love for you to pray this prayer the prayer is not magical it's not a formula what matters is if it's in your heart you have sincerity and you can say say Jesus it's me this morning I choose to open my heart to you I invite you to come into my heart I repent from my sins I receive your forgiveness this morning I want to experience your presence I want to experience your peace and I want to experience your joy fill me with the Holy Spirit and say this thank you for saving me today in Jesus name if you pray that prayer, every light was for just a moment. If you pray that prayer, just put your hand right now in the air. I want to see if that's you this morning or if you're online you can do this as well. Is there anybody that says, hey Jeremy, this morning I pray that prayer. This morning I open up my heart and I receive Jesus into my heart. Looks like we're all in. Looks like we're all in. That's wonderful. I would love to sing another song, one last song before we go. Maybe you've never prayed that prayer before. It's a bold prayer. So be careful before you pray. Have you ever asked God to come into your life and disrupt everything? To come and do what He has prepared you to do. To come and do what He had planned for you to do on this earth. you in such a way where you cannot be the same anymore. The heart of the prayer is more of you, Lord, at any cost. More of you, Jesus, at any cost. And so during this song, I'm going to be praying that prayer. I'd love for you to join as well. More of you, Jesus, at any cost. Amen.